Most information regarding circuit history and mythology is sourced to the Bodfell Codex. Recovered from SCP-2480, the Codex includes a partial translation of the Valkyron and related marginalia. Along with archaeological evidence, the Foundation have been able to establish the historiosity of Sarkicism. As essential as the Codex has been, large gaps remain in the timeline and much of the following is entirely speculative and subject to change. Early History Sarkic weapons, armor, and trinkets have been discovered among Minoan ruins on the island of Santorini, formerly Thera, possibly placing their origins to at least before the eruption event which triggered the complete collapse of Minoan civilization around 1500 BCE. Footnote 20 Not enough to suggest an invasion and occupation, more likely the items arrived via Minoan merchants and Central Asian trade routes. It is presently believed that Sarkicism itself did not reach the Mediterranean until approximately 1200 BCE, theoretically related to the Bronze Age Collapse. Davite tablets, dated to approximately 1800 BCE, refer to a slave rebellion in the northernmost province, led by a charismatic Heresiarch and Half-Blood. Scrolls discovered within contain phrases and terms archetypal to Sarkic cults, including references to a Grand Karsis Ion. These findings suggest that Sarkicism has existed for nearly 4,000 years. All evidence, linguistically and archaeologically, points to Western Siberia as Sarkicism's place of origin. Ion, if still alive, if having ever existed at all, likely represents a high-level reality bender and has been classified as POI-93. Footnote 21 Classified by the GOC as KTE-0452- Black forward slash four severe threat in 1952. This represents the earliest secular analysis of Ion. Little is known about the Grand Carsis, sorcerer king of Adatum, with all information being in the form of deification or demonization and lacking in factual reliability. Footnote 22. A city of unnumbered, unspeakable crimes, according to the ancient Mechanites, considered the capital of Sarkicism. It remains unknown if the location continues to exist in some manner. The Valkyron refers to Ion as having been born to a Davite mother and sired by a concubus father, implying that males born of such unions were destined for slavery. The exact nature of Ion's bondage is unknown, but his supposed intellect suggests that he was not used for combat or manual labor perhaps serving under an alchemist or priestess. It remains unknown which came first, Ion's doctrine or his revolution. It remains unknown which came first, Ion's doctrine or his revolution. If these events are grounded in reality, it is possible that the religion developed in coincidence with a slave revolt and as a way to codify their methods of anomalous warfare. In his mission, Ion was aided by four individuals known as the Clavigar. Figures of reverence and supposed disciples of Ion, they are the saints of Sarkicism. Hagiography Clavigar Nadox Associated with intelligence, wisdom, perception, and mysteries, epithets include the tongueless speaker, Lord of Mysteries, the All Seeing, and the Anticipation of Ion. Once a sage in the southernmost region of Davite influence, he preached a philosophy of peace and equality, building a following among the impoverished. Agitating the Deva, he was captured and publicly tortured, the poor he had tried to help now hurling stones upon him. Before the crowd of hundreds, drunk and atrocious in their stupidity, a Deva priestess cut off his tongue, sewed shut his mouth, and had him emasculated. Footnote 23 The complete removal of the penis and the testicles, an apparently common form of punishment among the matriarchal Davites. Rather than having Nadox executed, they instead had him marked, a symbol placed upon the forehead, impossible to remove, it designated him as a sufferer, one who the people were required, by the Deva's decree, to forever torment but never kill. Nadox wandered the land as a pariah, denied refuge and safe passage, struck with rocks and slashed with knives, all by the people he had hoped to save. It is written that he beheld, while suffering a fever dream, a messianic entity, one that could rescue him and humanity from an existence of suffering and tears. Nadox would travel north in search of the Savior to guide Ion towards his destiny. And Ion held six fingers aloft, and upon their spears did the soldiers impale themselves, 
For you, they cried before the blood drowned their tongues, and Ion said, Now do you see, and Nadox wept, as more did skewer themselves in Ion's name, for he had seen and now knew the truth of his words. Son Surus Clavigar Lobatar Associated with sex, love, eroticism, pleasure, motherhood, disease, and unrestrained reproduction, breeding, cancers, growth, etc. Epithets include the one whom Ion most desired, the high blood redeemer, and the mother, on rare occasion brood or hive mother. A priestess, as well as the daughter of a Deva matriarch, she was initially in opposition to Ion, whose revolution threatened her way of life. It is written that her hatred for Ion eventually became a sort of infatuation. Unable to remove him from her mind, she sought to capture and bind him as her consort. In her quest to make him hers, Lovatar sent wave after wave of slave hunters, but none returned. In time, it would be Ion who came to her by its own accord. It is written that Ion visited her in the night, bypassing her guards and appearing within her bedchamber. Instead of attacking, he sat upon the edge of the bed and quietly spoke to her. What was said is unknown, but resulted in Lobatar and Ion forming a union over a period of twelve days. Footnote 24 It is written that the words were meant for Lobatar alone and thus never recorded. On the twelfth day, the two left her palace behind, never to return. Beneath the black moon, her devotion took the form of a stone knife, like those of the reindeer folk of Adium. Penetrated amber blood colored by ancient sins poured from the wound, her tears like the warm rain of distant summers. Beneath the poison moon, the amber flowed no more, and the snow she painted red. Indecipherable for Ion, who drank deep the fermented honey of Lobatar's kiss, Ion surrendered upon her pale breast, a shared respite and ecstasy. Still, Ion hungered, and from Lobatar's dark lips flowed words. There is pleasure in serving. Smiling, he bowed lowered his head, knowing the drunk joy of milk and sweet fermented honey. Sown Tao. Clavigar Orok. A figure of reverence and supposed disciple of Ion, associated with strength, war, violence, wilderness, hunting, and seemingly in contradiction, loyalty and revolt. Epithets include the horned beast the Brute Lord, and the Pale Hunter. Described as being of unnatural physical strength, Orok was the product of alchemical and thermaturgical experimentation on slaves, enthralled the matriarch Asvigosa, the ruling Deva in the city of Jell. Orok served as a bodyguard and pit fighter. Footnote 25. Apparently considered the greatest gladiatorial combatant of his time. It is written that Ion, when taking the city of Jell, entered the palace of Matriarch Asvigosa, presumably the highest authority in the city. He requested that the Matriarch should leave and take with her a message to the Deva of Devas, lest she suffer retribution. Refusing his ultimatum, the Matriarch ordered Orok to destroy him. It is written that Orok hesitated, his runes of bondage setting his starved soul aflame so that his body became spirit. Turning to his Matriarch, he struck Asvigosa his fist imbued with the very power she had forced upon him and reduced her body to cinder and ash and heavenly starlight. As Orok said to the Kytherans, power is made from the pain of the fragile. Here weakness dies. Here strength is born. I exert myself. A pale reflection of Ion's sacrifice of flesh to the intolerable force, and shed frailty's husk. I commune with my Akaloth core, my sacred metamorphosis complete. Son Susk. Footnote 26. Kythra is a location that appears in both Sarkic and Church of the Broken God scripture. The Valkzeron describes the conquest of Kythra and the conversion of its people. The Maxwellian Book of Horrors associates the location with the prophesized NK-class end-of-the-world scenario. Footnote 27. A symbolic organism implanted in the bodies of Sarkic cultists, further discussed in the organism section. Clavigar Sarn a figure of reverence and supposed disciple of Ion, associated with darkness, secrecy, deception, poison, assassination, and justice, or Jaka. Footnote 28. Jaka translate as divide, separate, or even coal. It is employed in Socratism as a concept of cosmic justice, separating the strong from the weak, adherent from apostate, terminating those deemed enemy or unnecessary. Epithets include the Whisperer, the Coiled Shadow, 
the Faceless One, and the Judgment of Ion. A young house servant, she quietly endured daylight abuse throughout her life. Having suffered long enough, she calmly murdered the entire household with poison, garret, and dagger. Captured, she would be imprisoned within the fortress city of Cursed. Footnote 29 the first to fall so that he might rise, said to be the first kingdom to fall to Aditum, and having become symbolic of the inevitable defeat of those who stand in opposition to Sarkicism. Sarn was awaiting execution when first approached by Ion, who moved through the dungeon walls like the mist of summer snow melt. There he said, the winds whispered of your actions, there is no evil in the judgment, you do not choose to be the vessel of our will. Many will die this day, but you are needed alive. The Prophet's hand is described as having transformed into a wolfish maw, tearing apart the cell door with its teeth and liberating Sarn. Honing her skills, Sarn would eventually control a network of spies and assassins. A daylight tablet describes her efficacy in graphic detail, including men and women disemboweled in the streets and daylight infants strangled in their own cradles by traitorous servants. The heart is made silent still before her dagger scene, a moment immortalized in a single strike stab, the judgment unavoidable, inescapable, dismay, a death inconceivable, to the arrogance of Deva, triumph, a dagger in the darkness, with the blood of tyrants, our children sleep well, Sun Vaku. There is little available information about Sarkicism between circa 1600 and circa 1200 BCE, despite the period being considered the golden age of Sarkic civilization. It is during this period that Daybite culture recedes, existing only as a small city-state in what is now Mongolia. Footnote 30. It has been hypothesized that the Daybites sought to anomalously preserve themselves, as more and more territory was lost to Sarkites. It is theorized that the Adium Empire left little archaeological evidence for its existence due to Sarkic structures being composed of living organic material. War and the Fall of the Adium Empire Sarkic civilization, having reached its zenith, began to spread into Caucasus, Anatolia, Balkans, and parts of the Levant and the Mesopotamia. Impressed by or fearful of their anomalous capabilities, several tribal groups began to fight under the banner of Adium. These include Caskians, Proto-Thracians, Lycians, Ilians, and many others. The Hittite king, Supalulumia II, tried in vain to defeat the invaders, contributing to the fall of the Hittite Empire. Footnote 31 this information, as with all information involving Sarkicism, cannot be revealed to the public. Fortunately, most non-Foundation historians blame the events of the Late Bronze Age collapse on the mysterious Sea Peoples. The Adium Empire established a foothold in the Mediterranean, invading and colonizing the islands of Cyprus, Crete, and Garros. It is uncertain as to who struck first, but a coalition of kingdoms was formed in response to the Sarkic threat, resulting in a war around 1200 BCE. Archaeological findings such as mass graves, weapons, terrain damage, and primary source documents, such as scrolls recovered from Garros and the Aral Sea, reveal the extreme and anomalous nature of the war. Foundation historians estimate a death toll ranging from 20 to 30 million, making it the fourth most devastating war in recorded history. According to recovered documents, the coalition formed in response to the Adium Empire included Egyptians, Mycenaean Greeks, Minoans, Canaanites, Assyrians, and the Mechanites. Footnote 32. It appears that Minoans' conspirators fought on the side of the Adium Empire. Minoan civilization had been on decline at the time of the war. Footnote 33. The Mechanites are theorized as having been the driving force for the Coalition, seeking allies against a threat perceived by them as the end of the world. Although Greek in origin, the cult of Mechane had temples throughout the Mediterranean, most notably in Egypt and the Levant. Most details of the war are unknown to the Foundation. It is suspected that the deployment of colossi, such as SCP-2406, as well as the heavy use of a substance resembling Greek fire that turned the tide of war against the Sarkites. Footnote 34 Traditionally thought as having been deployed circa 672 CE. When the war was over, the Adium Empire was assumed destroyed along with Sarkic civilization. In reality, Sarkicism would continue in secret at both its homeland and the Urals, and among the tribes that have fought under the banner of Adium, such as among the Thracians and Dacians. 
The damage to the region was great, and many civilizations did not recover, resulting in the collapse of various kingdoms. A crisis of refugees, the decline of art, literature, science and technology, and the lingering disease and famine from Sarkit biological weapons, an event later known to historians as the Late Bronze Age Collapse. The fall of the Adium Empire also resulted in a Sarkit diaspora, leading to the development of culturally distinct Sarkit cults in places such as the Arabian Peninsula and the Indian subcontinent. Due to a lack of reliable information, the Foundation can only speculate about Sarkit activity between circa 1100 BCE and 1300 CE. The Rise of neo sarkicism the majority of known neo sarkic cults appear to descend from certain Carpathian noble families influenced by the proto sarkic Solomonari. Footnote 35 The Hunter's Black Lodge being the only known neo sarkic cult to not share this lineage, this is likely subject to change as the Foundation uncovers more sarkic organizations. It is unknown whether the Solomonari intentionally infiltrated Carpathian courts, or if they were instead sought out by the nobles themselves, ignoring or dismissing, possibly embracing the rumors of devil worship and witchcraft surrounding the cult. Documents and artifacts retrieved from SCP suggest that some Solomonari served as court magicians, advising their lords and ladies on matters of alchemy, medicine, astrology, and the occult. In time, this would result in the development of Sarkic great houses, affluent families practicing their own interpretation of Sarkicism, placing the individual above the collective and applying it to their own self-serving needs. This new strain of Sarkicism would spread throughout Europe via marriage. Once these footholds were established, the great houses grew incestuous.